To become one is the secret to a happy marriage, to a successful marriage. Now, the rest of the sermon is how do we do that? What does that look like? God created it to be holy, a holy union, sanctified, set apart. He established it again from creation. That the secret to the mystery of the church and Christ. Is about overcoming self. Brethren, uh, the last time I was here, and actually the very first day that I met uh, Boone, uh, I gave a message about uh, preparation for the coming Passover and looking at it and, and coming to understand that the, the covenant that we were going to re, uh, recommit ourselves to was actually a marriage covenant. Again, I don't think that had anything to do with it, but uh, it wasn't all that long after that that I got a call from Sarah and Boone asking for, for marriage counseling. And it, again, seems appropriate that we are over here now uh, to again give a message on marriage. Uh, as I said, the, the marriage covenant that God established for his church, but the marriage covenant which God first established between a man and a woman, the beginning of the family of God. So if you would, I'd like to begin, again, kind of at the beginning today. Uh, if you would turn with me to Genesis 2. And I have to say, this is one of my, uh, this is a scripture which always just amuses me to begin with. Uh, Genesis 2, and verse 18. Because God has finished his creation, you know, all the days have passed. And the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. And that just strikes me as funny because as, as all the men have been single and young, we don't like to be alone. You know, that's, that's one of the things that God implants in us. There's, there is a desire for more. There is that desire for the, the spouse. You know, we, I don't know at what age a young man decides that, oh, she's pretty. Uh, our little boy's kind of been like that since birth. Um, he likes the ladies. Uh, but it's funny because God, God built us this way. And again, even from the beginning, the Lord said, it's not good for man to be alone. I believe God designed from the beginning, even before he said this, knowing that he would give a helpmate for Adam. And he says, I will make him a helpmeet for him. Again, this is not a servant. This means comparable to him. Like him. Different, but similar. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. He's already created uh, male and female. But he brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. He's giving him roles. He's giving him responsibility. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. And this is where I think there's an awakening for Adam. Because he's like, all right, you know, well, here's, here's the birds, and there's the, the male birds and the female birds, and he names them. Here's the fish, there's the male fish, female, and he names them. And the animals, and he names them, males and females, and huh, where's mine? Wait a minute. 
everyone else has a partner. Everyone else has one that, that they will create a family with, offspring with. But there's just me. Again, I, I think God did this in the order that he did it so that the light bulb would go on for Adam. You know, so often, just telling someone, you know, something, you know, the answer to a question, is not as, they don't learn from it, truly. It's when they come to understand it themselves. When they come to ask the question themselves and say, wait a minute, how, how does this work in my life? This is how God is leading Adam to understand. Verse 21 And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. Verse 22, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And this is God's word. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, one. This is God's purpose for each and every one of us. And it is his purpose, not only for us individually, as children of God, but what is one of the terms that we use in referring to the church? The called out ones. The body of Christ. Bone of bone, flesh of flesh. One with the Lord. The title of my message today is Becoming One. Becoming One. This is one of the first commandments that God gave to Adam and Eve after he said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But to become one flesh, that's, that's complicated. It's easily said, but hard to do. That word uh, actually means to become united. It means to become united in purpose, in heart, in mind. It does mean this physically, intimately, but even more importantly, emotionally and spiritually. To become one, the same purpose, the same heart. How many of you have ever heard someone uh, approach an older couple that have been married for many decades and say, what's the secret to a happy marriage? You know? Because, I mean, frankly, if you look at uh, our society you know, and, the, and the rate of divorce, there's a lot of people who can't figure it out. I mean, what's the mystery? I, uh, I once heard a, uh, an interview between a an elderly man, a woman, had been married 70 years. And uh, they were sitting at a table, and the interviewer asked them, they said, well, what was the secret to, to the success of your marriage? And the, the little lady said, she goes, oh, it was the children. My husband goes, yes, it was the children. They go, really, the children? That's what kept you together? They said, well, yes, we made an agreement that whoever left had to take the children. <laughs> And they both got these little smiles, these little sparkles in their eyes. Because that's the thing. People people think it's like, oh, there's there's this one little thing that, you know, if we have this, then everything will be, you know, happily ever after. You know, the the Disney fairy tale ending and marriage. How many of you, I'll just ask, have maybe been married more than 40 years? Got some hands. Do you have any 50 years? We do. Okay, how, how many? 58. 58. Congratulations. <laughs> and uh, the Colbert's, how many for you? 56. 56. You, you all have been married longer than I've been alive. 
I don't. I mean, I mean that wonderfully. Uh, <laughs> not like wow. <laughs> I actually had someone ask me that once. I was I was talking. And I met them. Uh, we were talking about motorcycles and and uh, talking about you know, trying to encourage my wife to ride. And I said, "But all these years, never wanted to ride." And they said, well, you got time. I mean, how long have you been married? And at the time, I said, "Like, well, 22." And they went, "Really? Well, you know, 22 compared to 58 is nothing. But in our society, and the one man looks at me and goes, "Do the same woman?" <laughs> I mean. Again, by our standards today, that is shocking and surprising. Wow. I mean, to make it 20 years? Oh. And yet for those who have been in a different generation, those who understood that they made vows and promises, it was for life. As long as we shall both live. This is... What God intends for marriage. It is eternity that God intends for the bride of Christ. Forever. And it is a blessing. And it is beautiful. And it is a mystery. So if you're wondering about an SPS uh, to this message, again, entitled Becoming One, it is the secret to a happy marriage is to become one. To become one is the secret to a happy marriage, to a successful marriage. Now, the rest of the sermon is how do we do that? What does that look like? Again, becoming one is an interesting prospect, uh, particularly because men and women are very different. Yeah. Yeah. See, in our society today, people would be like, what? Different? In fact, I'll go so far as to say the things that society is talking about now, the gender fluidity, is completely wrong. God created them male and female. Similar, comparable, but different. And he created that difference to be something beautiful. He created that difference to be something which we will come to grow in and learn and to understand the relationship between himself and Christ of unity. God sanctified marriage. He made the marriage covenant holy. Um, You know, as we've already read uh, Genesis 2, um, it is used throughout the Word of God. It is quoted over and over again. Matthew 19 and verse 6, Christ quotes this himself in uh, in the Gospels about divorce because the Pharisees are trying to trip him up. And they're like, well, yeah, but what about divorce? Because it was rampant at the time. And Christ responded, So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. He quotes again from Genesis that a man is to leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. And he says, Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. God created it to be holy, a holy union, sanctified, set apart. He established it again from creation. The first thing I think he truly did after the Sabbath that makes it holy. Uh, Paul talks about our children being holy because at least one of the parents is called to become holy as he is holy. Paul writes about this in Ephesians 5, verse 31. Again, quoting from Genesis Ephesians 5, verse 31 says, And for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Again, that's a quote. In verse 32, he says, This is a great mystery. Not only on how two biologically different individuals are supposed to become one, 
but speaking of the church. And he says, I speak concerning Christ and the church. Remember the bride of Christ. And verse 33 he says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. Brethren, becoming one in marriage, again, shows us the mystery of Christ and the church. Remember, he laid down his life for his bride. He was willing to die for her. Ladies, you don't have to nod your heads or raise your hands, but isn't that kind of the the hope that there is a man who will love you so much, care for you so much, that he would be willing to not only protect you and serve you, fight for you, and even die for you. That's what romance novels are made of. Movies. That's ingrained in us. And that is what Christ has done with us and for us. And that is what we are to be growing into in our own marriages. As man and woman, as husband and wife. To have this become so precious to us that we see it just as Christ sees all of us as the bride, as the church. This was so important that this is aspect of becoming one is what Christ prayed before he was crucified. Let's turn to John 17. Again, this is the secret, the mystery. John 17. In verse 17, again following on the heels of Mr. Bacher's sermonette message, he says, sanctify them. Again, make them holy. Set them apart. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. He's preparing himself for this marriage. That they also may be sanctified by the truth, by the word of God, by obedience to it. I do not pray for these alone, the disciples who were there with him at the table, those who had followed him and seen the miracles and the witnesses, or, and witnessed it, but for you and I. He says, but I also pray for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. That's those who have have read and believed. Verse 21, that they all may be one. United. Called out. The ecclesia. That they all may be one as you... Father are in me, and I in you. Perfect unity. United in in heart, in mind, in purpose. That they also may be one in us. United with them to become holy as they are holy. That the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me, or excuse me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am. Again, joined together. We, We call this the marriage supper. The the groom will return. And And that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Can you think of a more beautiful thing to say? I have loved you 
before the foundation of the world. I have desired you. I have wanted this union. I have waited for it, worked for it. This is the type of passion God wants from us for Him as well as our covenant in marriage. Verse 25, O righteous Father, the world has not known you. The world doesn't understand this. But I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Brethren, this is the mystery of Christ and the church. Again, the, the secret to a happy marriage, just as in being called to join with Christ, to be the bride of Christ, he gives us this opportunity to learn in holy matrimony, being set apart, sanctified, called to become one as we grow into these relationships. Brethren, I would put to you that the key, the secret, the mystery to becoming one, not only with our spouse, but with God, is overcoming ourself. The secret to becoming one is to overcome the self. Becoming one with our spouse is truly about agape love. It's not what is best for me or what my desires are. It's about what's best for them. You know, as a young man, I loved my bride. I wanted to marry her. It was so important. And there was, there was some rocky time before we got married. We were in counseling. and In fact, we showed up on the minister's door, and uh, we were both ready to call it quits. We were there for our first counseling, and we were both like, we're done. <laughs> he spent more than eight hours with us, straight. We, we, we met uh, on a Sabbath in the morning. We were, it was supposed to be a, hey, let's talk, get together, and have some coffee. We missed church because it was so intensive. Um, and there was so much baggage and there was family issues and, and all of that. Coming to understand that this girl that I loved, that I desired, that I wanted to become one with, that I wanted to start a family with, uh, just the two of us. I wasn't even thinking about kids yet. But it was that desire to feel like I was not missing a limb. Because I think so often that's the way we feel when we're alone, is that like there's a part of us that isn't there, that's, that's yet to be attached, like, like an amputee who says, well, I know it's not there, but it feels like it should be. We did get married. But I can tell you that over the last 27 years, the understanding of the love and the desire, the, the crave, the need that I had for her has changed. There comes a point where our love matures to a place where I love them more than I love myself. That their needs are more important than mine. It is about dying to oneself and truly living for the good of the other. I want to kind of make an example of this by, by looking at the traditional uh, marriage vows. Um, if you've been to weddings, if you've watched weddings on TV, you've, you've pretty much heard some of these vows, uh, as I'll read them. Uh, the minister will also often you know, grab them and say, you know, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, to love and to cherish 
until death do us part. People have been saying these words, making these vows to one another forever. Yet so many of them don't truly understand what that means. Again, most of the people who get divorced have said, till death do us part. But that's not what what happened. So I want to look at this overcoming self of agape love and to look at these vows. Again, these traditional vows, not only for a man and wife, but for ourselves and for God. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have. Again, more often than not, when we think of uh, to have, um, you know, uh, again, my own, my own youth, I just have to marry her. I have to have this person. You know, it's, it's not a very mature love. Again, we all feel that way at times. But it's something that we're supposed to grow with, to mature with. That word actually is a legal word, uh, and it means to take possession, to, uh, to own, and it is legally binding. Again, part of the traditional vows that many have, have used is, do you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband? To take, to have this individual. Now, again, it's not truly selfish because you're making a commitment. It's like, you know, you've been saving up your money and you buy your first home. You take possession of it. It is now legally yours. It is what it's going to become, if it will grow or if it will fall into disrepair, is on you. And you have to pay the bills. You've got to, you, that's your responsibility. That's what it means to have. I am taking responsibility for the care and the well-being and the love and the safety and protection of this person. To have them. To say, this is my husband. This is my wife. For the two of you, the first time you say that, it's going to feel a little weird, but awesome. You introduce, this is my wife. This is my husband. There is a feeling of possession. And again, God intended this in spite of, again, what some in the world will say. This is what God intended. To have and to hold. To hold means to keep close, and not just to grab a hold of. It means to keep close, to have it be precious. Again, to take possession, to, you know, there is that. But it's a precious possession. To keep close. This is one of those things that, for all of us who've been married for a little while, understands that if you're not together, are you really married? If you live apart, if you're separated, for for many different reasons, these things can happen. But you can't be, again, married if you're never around each other. That's, That's not a real marriage if we're gone all the time, if we're doing other things, then we're not holding. This marriage is precious. This is one of the things that we desire. You know, no no young couple who gets married wants to get married and then be like, all right, see ya. No, we want all the days ahead. That's something that we have to maintain. And we have to be working on continually. Again, just like our marriage covenant to Christ. How many of you have ever met somebody who does not strike you as a Christian, but they say, no, I was baptized years ago, I'm saved. 
But are they living like they're married to Christ? No, that's, that's what this vow means. To have and to hold. I'm going to keep this. I'm going to live this every day. This is, again, part of, of the mystery. For better or for worse. You know, this. sometimes you'll hear it said, in the good times and in the bad. Again, there's no escape clause uh, in this. Uh, in our society today, people uh, don't want to sign a two-year phone contract. Because well, what if I don't like the phone? What if I don't like this? What I, you know, Getting somebody to sign a one-year lease agreement on a house is really tough. Getting them to keep it. But this is a vow that we say. For better, for worse. How many of us would describe the best friend you've ever had in your life? Would you describe them as the person who knows you completely? They know all your good points and all your bad points. And they still like you. They still love you. Even on your bad days, when you are just in a funk and you are not really being a very good friend to them. When it's hard, when it's, I, my, my mom told me this one time. She said, yes, you're in love, but just understand that there will be a day when your spouse is the last person on earth that you want to see. Can I get an amen from the married people? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> we all go through those times. But what we don't do is quit. You don't quit in the bad times. That's someone who is committed. You know, I'm not, I'm not just your fair weather spouse, which, again... You can hear people actually say, you know, well, it was good until it wasn't as good. And then I wanted to go somewhere else or do something else, and I have to follow my heart. Again, where's the truth in that? Where's the truth in the statements that we say? We are not fair weather spouses, we are in it for life for better, for worse, in the good times and in the bad. Not because we want to go through the bad times, but because if we don't want to be abandoned, why would we abandon someone else? What does the word of God tell us? I will never leave you nor forsake you. All our spouse is asking, all our future groom, Christ, is asking, is that we do the same. The next vow, for richer, for poorer. Uh, When my wife and I were engaged and ready to be married, my in-laws were not happy about it. Uh, I came, she came from a more affluent family. Uh, We were dirt poor. Hardworking, but poor. And uh, there was a lot of tension. And uh, her family was putting on the wedding, and it was going to be really big, and they hired a wedding planner. And she picked up on very quickly that the family was incredibly disapproving, and Joy and I were kind of, oh, boy. And, you know, words were said. And... This lady looks over at the two of us, and we're holding hands. And she puts her hand on ours, and she turns to Joy. And she said, and in the, she said it loud enough so the family could hear. And she said, honey, I've been married three times. She said, the first time I'm married, I'm married for love. And she said, he was a good man. We had wonderful years together, and he got sick. And he died, and I lost the love of my life, my youth. He said, the second time I got married, I was a little more pragmatic, and I got married for money. 
And he said, that man loved his money more than he loved me. He loved himself more than he loved me. He loved doing all these other things more than he loved me. He said, that didn't work out. He cheated on her. He left. He broke the covenant. She said, you know who I'm married to now? She said, I'm married to a godly poor man. Because he loves God and he loves me more than he loves anything else. She said, don't you worry about those other things. She patted our hands. Money can be a root of evil. What will we love more? For richer, for poorer? My poor bride, who uh, married me and came from affluence, uh, and we've eventually built ourselves up, and you know what? Uh, Like 12 years into it, bankrupt. Do you know how many divorces come from bankruptcy? From money issues? Because maybe there's a trial. Sometimes people won't work. They're not committed to it. They're not upholding their vows. But sometimes things happen. The economy goes down. There's layoffs. There's, it's hard to do those things. But are we going to quit? Would Christ quit on us? Sometimes the way Christ looks at it, he he doesn't care about money. He cares about how rich we are spiritually. Sometimes spiritually we are poor. Does Christ walk away from us? Again, the same vows, the same desires, the same thing that we want from Christ. He's saying, do this with one another. In the good times, in the bad times, in the in the the wealth and in the poverty. That those things will not sway us. In sickness and in health. I've met people. I, I know a young man who I was married and things were going well. They were both professionals and successful, both making good money. And he started having headaches and having problems. And eventually uh, he got into a, the right doctor and they did all the right scans and they figured out that he had a brain tumor, a cancerous brain tumor. And after a year of chemotherapy and of treatments, uh, building up to a surgery, um, the bride divorced him. And she literally said, I didn't sign up for this. Except she did. In front of witnesses. She said, in sickness and in health. So often, when things like this happen, we see someone's true nature, their true character. This is why we go through trials, partly because God is looking for our true nature, our heart, our character. Will we hold fast no matter what? Will we love them even when they are sick and broken and they they can't love us back in the same way? Um, My own wife, um, so this was six years ago. Uh, shortly, about a year and a half after our son was born, discovered that she had breast cancer. Um, she had had uh, problems with mastitis and stuff, so she noticed a lump, but we didn't, didn't think too much about it. And all the doctors kept saying, you're far too young for this to be cancer. It, it's something else, until it was cancer. And we went through all of that. We went through the chemo, and we went through the, the surgeries. And afterwards we were we survived we were kind of an emotional wreck um, but we were so thankful and I remember talking uh, to one of the surgeons and they had helped to reconstruct the breast she had had to have a full mastectomy and I thanked the doctor I said you know uh, 
for a woman to lose this part of herself, which is so womanly, is, is a part of who she is. It's feminine. I said, it's not the same, but you have helped her feel like herself again. And I feel like that doesn't matter. But when she feels like herself, I'm getting my girl back. And it was interesting because the doctor had a different reaction than I expected. She got sad. And she said, I can count on my hand the number of times a husband has thanked me. It's like, really? Are you kidding? And she said, actually, I have seen the worst in humanity. She said, I can't tell you how many women have lost their husbands. Because the husband said, she's disfigured. There's a problem here. She's sick. I don't want her anymore. I remember talking with youth, you know, encouraging them about marriage and love and what it really means. I mean, you meet, you know, you meet eyes, they connect across a distant room. Maybe there's dancers and smoke. Who knows? We're talking the fairy tale. But all of a sudden there's a spark. There's chemistry. And God created that, so it's good. You're supposed to have that. And they're like, wow, she's beautiful. And she's like, wow, he's so handsome or he's cute. I was never cute in my life, so I have something against cuteness. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we're like, oh, wow, there's an attraction. And then we're supposed to find out about who they are, their character, their heart. That's who we're supposed to love. Not the outward appearance. Girls, do you want a guy to only love you for how you look from day to day? No. You want him to love you no matter what you look like. You want him to love you because of your heart. The all of you. You know, if if you felt like you had to worry about his glance being turned because of every other girl who walks by... No, it's, it's not about the image of the person. It's about the reality of who they are. Because I've told the kids, I'm like, you know, yeah, he's, you know, six foot two, 180 pounds, handsome. Someday he's going to look like this guy. <laughs> and if you are not really in love, uh, you're going to see him very critically. This is one of the things, I, you know, I, I think truly we have to be committed to that. I will love you no matter what. I will desire my spouse no matter what. No matter the sickness, no matter the health. And this it says also forsaking all others. When we commit to that one person, um, how many of you ever heard of, you know, well, twoo love? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know I, I'm, I'm quoting a movie, The Princess Bride. Um, but so often they talk about, it's like the one person. You know, like they'll, they'll talk to couples and they're like, is this the one? There's not one. There's never been just one. You choose one. That's what we do. We choose one, and it doesn't matter who comes along later. I chose you. I choose you every day, no matter what. I choose not to be drawn away by another. You know, so often people talk about, well, I couldn't help it. I just fell in love with somebody else. That's not the promise that we make. We're told to flee fornication. You know why? Because you can't stand up to it. You play with fire, you will get burned. 
These are the things which we choose to do. Even in the world, look at how much temptation there is. All the time it's being thrown at us. And not just, you know, between men and women, but just, oh, you can cheat on this. You can, you can cheat on your taxes. You can mark more time on your card than you actually worked. You don't have to pay this. Whatever it is. We have to choose to be faithful. Choose to be honest. This is, again, an issue of our heart and our character. It's not about our emotions, our feelings. The heart is deceptively wicked. And yet, what do you hear in all the Disney movies? Follow your heart. I couldn't think of like an actual term off the top of my head, but uh, most of you will will recognize that in some of these movies, you know, the old ones and the new ones. You just have to follow your heart. No, the heart lies. The heart will get you into trouble. The heart is not wise. We cannot have our head turned all the time by anything that comes along, anything that will distract us. We have to forsake all others. Our spouse and our God come first. These are our priorities. And we don't cheat on them. We have to be there. And I think of this not only physically, but emotionally. You have to be there for them. How many of you have ever heard the term, especially for the ladies, um, he's just not emotionally available? (laughs) Right? We're withholding a part of ourself. Again, we can do this in our own relationship with God. Well, God, I, I do love you. I'm keeping the Sabbath. I'm keeping the holy days. But there's this part of me that I'm just not ready to, to give to you yet. A lot of that is fear. We're, we're afraid of being hurt. And so we close off that part of ourselves. We do that with God and we can do that with someone else or with our spouse. And again, the problem with cutting ourselves off from our spouse is that we will most often look for that somewhere else. Maybe it starts with just conversation or whatever, but suddenly you're telling them things you would never tell your spouse. When When does that become unfaithful? When does that emotion lead us into something which is breaking our covenant? Again, we have to be committed. If there's something between my wife and I that I'm... I'm afraid to deal with. You know what I have to do? Deal with it. The more we separate ourselves, we're we're breaking that covenant. Again, there's wisdom in this. We grow in it. We mature in it. But we have to be committed to them. I will be faithful. No matter what, I will forsake everything else, everyone else. Not only to my spouse, but to my God. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. This is a promise, a vow. To love something. Again, it's not something we just fall into or fall out of. I'm making a promise to love. It's interesting because the way that we do this um, is so much more than just an emotion. It, It is what we do. How many of you have heard of the love languages? Um, Again, it's an understanding of the way people both receive and show love. Uh, Some, it is uh, words of encouragement. 
Uh, it's quality time together, <clears throat> excuse me, gift giving, physical touch, and I can never remember the fifth one because it's important to my wife, and I always forget. Um, I'm kind of joking. Um, but it's funny because the way that I may feel loved is not necessarily the way my spouse recognizes and receives love themselves. So if I love them, I'm going to go out of my way to do the things that make them feel loved. You know what really makes my wife feel loved? If I do the dishes. I hate doing dishes. You know, that was the punishment when I was a kid. Whoever's in trouble, you're on dish duty. And so, but it's acts of service. That is what makes my wife feel loved when I do things for her. When she sees me doing things with the kids, it makes her get all gooey and warm inside. It's also the way she shows love. If she loves you, she feeds you, obviously. <laughs> um, it, is, it is the way that she does that. It is something that you can see, something that we know. One of the things that she even struggled with with her father um, because he wasn't an overly affectionate kind of guy. He didn't say, I love you very often. He would. But she came to understand that every time she saw her dad, he was out checking the tires on her car. He was out checking and making sure that her car was safe for her, that it had what it needed, that she had what she needed. And it it was one of the most obvious ways of saying, I love you without actually using the words. It was what he was doing for her. There are always things that we have to do to show that we love someone. Because let's face it, it's easy to say. It's hard to live up to. The proof is in the pudding. You will know them by their fruits. You say you love me? Prove it. Let's see the commitment. Let's see you doing something outside of your comfort zone. Go shopping with your wife. That's you really my big one because I'm like, this has to prove that I love you. <laughs> you know. And they do stuff for us too. Not because they want to, but because they love us. It's evident. It is not enough to say something. We have to do it. After all, this is in our relationship with God, isn't it? Again, mercy and truth. Truth. The Gospel of John, Christ tells us, If you love me, keep my commandments. That's proof. The person who loves me is going to do these things. And John writes it again. For this, excuse me, John 5 and verse 3. 1 John 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And it is not burdensome. You know, if, if we do something with our spouse, we're... We're doing something that they want to do. Not necessarily something that we want to do, but something they want to do. But we're acting like it's this huge burden that kind of negates the doing it, right? It kind of negates the going shopping. It kind of negates the the romantic movie or whatever it is that you really don't want to do. And if you're letting them know the whole time that you're miserable... Do you think they feel loved? No. Love can be seen. It's in our behavior, it's in our words, it's in the things that we do. It is how we live. Becoming one with the other person. Not because it's always what I want, it's what they need. 
agape love. And the last vow, the last promise, is until death do us part. To be united. I am committed for life. Again, this is the promise which we make to our spouse when we are brought in covenant with them. It is the promise which we make to God when we are baptized, when we repent and are baptized and receive his Holy Spirit. I will not quit. No matter what. Again, the good times, the bad times, all these things, that's essentially signing your name to it. It's like the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Here's, our, here's the problem, here's the vows, here's what we're going to do. And we commit our lives, our estates, our fortunes, our health, everything to this. This is what God wants from us. This is what our spouse wants to hear. This is signing your name. Nothing but death will part us. Again, this is what Christ wants from us. If you would turn with me to Romans 8. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He's saying, is it possible for a person to separate me from the love of Christ? What is it that could do it? Can anything? He says, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? What is it that's going to make Christ stop loving us? In verse 36, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. I will not quit no matter what. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through the tribulations, through the trials, through him who loved us. Because Christ is walking it with us. So often we, we talk about the threefold cord that is not easily broken. A marriage, a man, a woman, and God. That is what binds us together and makes us one. In verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, this is the love that Christ prayed for, for you and I, before his crucifixion. You and me, I and thee, and in them. This is becoming one. This is overcoming ourselves to truly see the needs of the other, to truly have agape love for the other person. Again, it is in our marriage, it is in our families, it's in our congregations for the brethren, it is in the bride of Christ. In Revelations, I I won't go there for the sake of time, but in Revelations 2, it talks about the churches. You know, these are the people who are the body of Christ. They are followers of Christ. They are part of the bride waiting for the groom to return to them. In each one of these, he says, you've got good things. You've made the covenant. You are committed. However, you have something to overcome. Brethren, if if you've been married long enough, 
you have things to overcome. Again, it's, it's about ourselves. Overcoming self. Sometimes it's that we've forgotten our first love. That first passion. And not just the intimacy, but the zeal. The heart. How often do people say, I feel like we're just roommates. We're just living in the same house now. That can and does happen to virtually every couple. If we feel that way, we have to stir it up. Reignite that desire, that passion, that commitment. Just like we're told to stir up the Holy Spirit. And it says, he who overcomes. He who overcomes will be at the wedding supper. He who overcomes over and over to each part of this body of Christ, to each part of the bride who's waiting. Don't be distracted by these other things. Don't don't let persecutions drive you away from me. Don't let the hard times, all these things which we make covenant to God with, let us understand that the secret to the mystery of the church and Christ is about overcoming self. Brethren, the secret to a good and blessed and happy marriage is for each person to become one. Becoming a new creation by letting go of us or me and becoming one. One flesh, united in purpose, united in heart. I am committed to you no matter what, till death do us part. I will choose you every day. I will choose even on the bad days, even on the poor days, even on the sick days. This has been given to us and it is a blessing. And it is training for the future. This is the hope that we each have as members of the bride of Christ. This is the hope that we have for Boone and Sarah. This is the hope that we have for all of our youth, for all of our children, for all those who want that type of relationship, to have the marriage as God intended it, to become one. It's our job to help them to do that. You have received this information based upon the Word of God. Every additional topic concerning the truth, which originates in Scripture, builds understanding leading to salvation. We hope you will personally review the Scriptures Cited in this presentation. God will teach you if you ask Him. Until next time, good day.